I am reminded, since he brought up graduate school, of two things. Mike doesn't remember it. Uh, but when I took my oral comps, my first set of questions was from the colonial historian. And he started out my exam by saying, tell us what you know about Charles Andrews. Now, for my fellow PhDs, Charles Andrews is 100 years ago an institutionalist historian who wrote about basically the British bureaucracy and the coming of the revolution. I had never read Charles Andrews. I then spent 10 minutes doing what many of you have seen me do many times in the past. I made it up as I went along. <laughs> And at the end of that 10 minutes, my second professor, who was the antebellum professor, said, Gary, I'm a little bored. I'd like to talk about something you know about. <laughs> so he then asked me to choose what I do, and I did. Well, I kind of feel like this today, especially in the presence of, of Don, who seems to know a lot more about this than I do. So those of you who are used to me making it up, today I'm going to actually look at my notes and make it up as I go. And I want to start out with the idea that this is not my period. This is not particularly my specialty. And I have always thought that these are the years that quite often we know the least about in this particular part of North Carolina. And part of that is rooted in two things that many of you who do local history with me know about. The first one is that the US Census does not list all the households until 1850. And therefore, we often jump at that and use all kinds of analysis that we didn't have before. The second one's very simple. Rowan and most places around here didn't have newspapers until after the War of 1812. So in many ways, this is a talk about what I've learned about Rowan and this period that I simply did not know very much about. And I want to start with one of the most surprising yet small things that I learned on this topic. And that is, in order to share with you what I've learned about Salisbury in this period, I went to the famous court of quarter session, pleas and quarter sessions, and I looked at the profile of what was happening. And I learned something that had a connection to, shall we call it, the patriotism, or the traditional patriotism of the War of 1812. And that is, when our court was in session for the first day of each session, and I'll pass these around, it told you the year of our liberty. So I'm going to read to you from 1812. This day in August, in the year of our Lord, 1812, in the 37th year of our liberty, oh, excuse me, our independence. Anybody want to do the math? What's the date? No, no, no. Dates? 75. 75. What's the reference to? The Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence. I find it again in 1814. Same math. And they are making references to what we would consider around here the very controversial and problematic Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence. The point I'm making is not that this proves there was one. It doesn't. But it does tell us that these people had liberty on their mind. Now Bob, my old colleague from reenacting, is doing a second aspect of that. You'll show your hat, Bob. He is portraying the people who were originally called the 76 men, the silver hairs, as they were also called. Note that Bob brought the right prop here. <laughs> and, yes. But I deserted from Bob's unit in 1987, and he still hadn't found me. At any rate, Bob is portraying the people I'm going to be talking about today. He has on the militia frock coat and basically the uniform and hat that would have been characteristic of many of the people who would have shown up here. Thank you, Bob. And essentially, I was trying to show you they had what on their mind. They had their heritage of fighting the British the first time somewhat on their mind as they fought the British the second time. And that leads to my next point of, of, shall we say, local discovery. And that is the very fascinating thing. Why did they come here? Why Salisbury? Now, if you read the thing that I made up as I went with Mark Winnicka yesterday in the Post, you might have read my wonderful little lead where I said Salisbury was Fort Bragg. I was very proud of that. 
But that's probably a lie. But it was in many what? Huh? Well, I made the myth up, but at any rate, what I mean is essentially we were the logistical center. So if you like the old joke that real estate is always about location, 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 in many ways what Salisbury was, it was still the place. It was still the center of the North Carolina backcountry where most of the major roads from the Cape Fear, from Salem, from the Brushy Mountains, from Lincolnton, from even Charlotte, converge. And my assumption is that in many ways, it was decided to put this base, as I'm going to call it here, uh, here in Salisbury because both the convergence of the mustard militia and the convergence of the logistical supplies may well have been the reason that it was set up. Now recently, Ray Barber from the Historic Foundation has tried to figure out where that base was. James Brawley, our predecessor historian, found out essentially that it was on Crane Creek and Ray's research has indicated that very likely this base of barracks was on Greenville Ferry Road where it hits McCandless Road as you're about, what, two miles down from town, you are going down into a floodplain. Is that about right, Ray? And what I figured out after using Ray's uh, formula is very likely it was located there for two reasons. The first one was if they were up on the hill, which is where Ray thinks they may have been, then they had to be near a watershed with a grist mill. And if you were to drive out there today and go right past this little low-lying area, you would go back up the hill and on the house on the right, you would see two grist stones. You would see two millstones that I know go back to an original grist mill. My assumption is that those set of barracks, which were there the entire period of the war, were located there probably because a mill was located there. Whose it was, I'm still working on it, changed hands a lot. But also because there is a very easy cut through road that led straight to the trading fort. So if you assume that the convergence of the roads is occurring, that's the best compromise site that also then took in the third condition, you didn't let those crazy people stay in town. <laughs> because drunkenness, whoredom, whatever, yes, I know they're all good Lutherans, you may tell me that, but, but essentially there was the assumption of isolation, yet centrality of location. And that's why I think Ray and I have figured out together the most likely candidate for where that is. Now what do we mean by those barracks? Well, the only descriptions we have is that it was a set of huts. We have to kind of assume they were log huts, and we don't precisely know how many there were. I did find a reference in the 1814 muster that they only had half as many huts as they had troops. And if it's true that 1,200 troops came, that seems to be the max that could have come, then that meant that there were enough huts for 600 people, crudely speaking. And if you were putting anywhere from what, to eight to 10 in one, it's still like an encampment of perhaps as many as 60 of these huts. Keep in mind that this logistical idea seems to be extremely important for why Salisbury was picked. I'm gonna give you another reason. And the other reason may be the bank. What I keep running into with the scarcity of documents that I found was the idea that officers who came to town more frequently always had to settle their accounts. In other words, they were going to stores, they were going to merchants, they were going to local people, and they were buying, selling, and frolicking, perhaps. And my, it has dawned on me that since I know that Salisbury was in many ways the center of banking at that point, it would later move to Charlotte, it may very likely be that Salisbury simply was the best repository of the necessary funding that you would have needed to actually establish this base. Again, very much speculative, but nevertheless, as close as we can figure out to what really was happening. So when you ask, why Salisbury? My assumption is still, at least at that period, it was still in the center of everything. 
just as today we remain, I'm looking at Margaret Klutz as I think of this, we're still at the center of where railroads can go in multiple directions. That's always been our asset and it could continue to be. Now what happened here? Well, when war was declared in 1812, Salisbury was chosen as the muster and supply center and people started to converge. Sarah Lemon, who, Lehman, say it for me, Mike, Lemon, who taught at Meredith for decades and wrote this very wonderful book on the War of 1812 in North Carolina, suggested that the records said that not only was Salisbury the rendezvous point for North Carolina, but that troops from Georgia and South Carolina and occasionally Virginia were also sent here. She has linked Salisbury's base to recruiting efforts to actually get some of the militia to be volunteers into the regular army. And she has de detailed as much as was possible the actual story of the 10th US Regiment, which was sent northward in, I think it was 1813, and included people from all over the southeast. What I've been unable to figure out, and my colleagues here have looked, haven't quite figured it out, is that we can't tell you the names of any Rowan people who actually marched to the north. We can't tell you they didn't, and we can't tell you they did. It is very clear that some North Carolinians were involved with this regiment when it marched north, but again, it's, it's unlikely to be able to prove to you that if your ancestors in these muster lists they ended up at Niagara. We just simply can't know. But we do know that the actual recruitment of this bait, of these soldiers, led to some continuing controversy. And I want to tell you a little bit about that before we head on to the real stuff. Salisbury was a Federalist town. When Don talked about the political conflicts this morning, basically, Salisbury was a place where the Federalists, who were the anti-war people, were concentrated. And when I say concentrated, I mean truly concentrated. We tend to look at our past and assume that the pattern of our county is the pattern that we know about from the 1850s and 60s. So when we look at who's who in our past, we talk about Millbridge, we talk about Mount Vernon or Woodleaf, we talk about Mount Ella, and quite frankly, none of those places existed yet. And in fact, many of our prominent families didn't quite live there yet, at least in terms of what would become their prominence. So here's what I found out. Salisbury, in the early 1800s, did have about 25 very rich people. You've heard of most of them. But almost all of them lived right here up to the trading fort. So I found references in the court minutes to, I love the phrase, their river plantations. You would translate that into local ease as Long's Ferry Road. If you were rich here, you were also rich that way, but not those ways. The concentration of wealth went straight towards where the interstate crosses the river today. And that's a very important clue to our beginning to put together what this war did to this place. I'll come back to that later. So I went, I went and I looked at the census in 1800 and 1810, and if you'll excuse me, I'm look, getting my notes here. And here's what I found. In 1800, the richest man in this area, this little triangle, was a man named John Kelly. He will, be, he'll, he will have died by 1813 and his wealth somewhat distributed. The actual second richest man was Alexander Long. Number three, you've heard of John Steele, and we'll come back to him in just a little bit. There were others who were equally wealthy, all, I mean close to being equally wealthy, and they have fundamentally could essentially be part of this concentration. By 1810, you had the same basic concentration, but Alexander Long and John Kelly had increased their slaves. In other words, what I found from 1800 to 1810 was that the rich got richer, but guess what? 
the poor got poorer. If I actually go look at slaveholding anywhere else in this county, there are fewer slaves in 1810 than in 1800. But right up the road, there are more. Something's changing. And what I'm finding is that if you lived up there, you stayed. But if you lived anywhere else, you tended to go away. Now, there are numerous references to Rowan County and out-migration to the West. And there is a legend in Rubble's book, for our guests, that's our first county history, that there were two out-migrations of significance, and he does mention one in the early 1800s. I don't know how to prove that, except that Rowan doesn't grow very much from 1800 to 1810. In fact, there isn't even natural increase. So if you assume that that's the case, then you really actually have population loss. But Salisbury doesn't grow. So the population of Salisbury in 1800 is roughly at 700. The population of Salisbury in 1810 is roughly above 700. In other words, no change. Hardly any change at all. But if you go to Oregon Church, the Lutheran Church to the south of town, and you count baptisms as an indication of people who stay and do you know what, here are your numbers for a decade. These are numbers of baptisms per year. 28, I'm starting 1801, 28, 25, 27, 30, then you have a 45, and it's an 1805, 39, that's 1806, and then 29 in 1807, 36, 31, 21, 24 in 1812. In other words, with some exceptions, it's pretty what? Pretty flat line. So if you assume, again, natural increase, people are leaving. People are leaving. And so what you have is a flat economy for most people. Frustration will perhaps be but yet the rich have a greater stake in local growth. The rich have a greater stake in local growth. Now I have one other piece of evidence, and it comes from a Lutheran minister named Paul Henkel, who visited Luther, Union Lutheran Church, and if you don't know, Union Lutheran is about a mile from where these barracks were. He wrote in 1811, the audience was small as most of the Germans have moved away. Most of the Germans have moved away. And so what you have here, at least locally, on the eve of this war, is stagnation, or at least they perceive it to be stagnation. And there might be a whole host of other reasons I haven't begun to look at, land deeds, whatever, but it suggests that there were some local motives which were mixing essentially what people wanted. When Salisbury was Federalist, I can't prove to you that the rest of the county wasn't voting for, for Jeffersonians. They were Republicans, as the phrase was, because we simply don't have the election data to prove it either way. And I need to remind you, in case you say the election data is there, that you could go to any precinct you wanted and go vote, that you didn't have to vote in Morgan's precinct if you wanted to walk to Salisbury to vote on election day. And so we can't prove either way what was going on in terms of the politics. By the way, if you didn't know, in 1810, your election precincts were Salisbury, Mox, I assume all of you know that's Moxville, Lexington, Flat Swamp. Anybody know where it is? Yes. Towards? Yeah, towards Denton, over in the area near Denton, and Morgan's. Morgan's was the East Rowan one. And then there was one called Thompson's Mill, which was to the east of today's Enochville. All of these precincts, by the way, will send people to the musters that we're about to talk about soon in 1814. And so what I'm finding is a very interesting mixed idea of what was going on here in terms of all the various things Don talked about, which restrictions on trade, the possibilities of Western expansion, and also the political ideology, which he was discussing. So all these things have local components that are very linked to the national ideas which he so astutely presented this morning. 
Now, once the base is established, it's very active. You run into sporadic records that throughout 1812, there were huge efforts towards the actual sending of supplies and the mustering of troops. And you also run into conflict again. And it comes in the form of a man named James Wellborn, who lived supposedly near Wilkesboro. I think he actually lived more towards what I think is Yatkin County today. And Wellborn was put in charge at various times of both recruiting for the regular army, and he wanted desperately to become the field commander for the regular army regiment. And you run into all kinds of references to him being a problem. So he complains at first of being unable to raise all the supplies. He talks about the fact that there is lingering anti-war sentiment in Salisbury. Do you remember Don talking about anti-war ideas? Well, Salisbury opposed this war. Salisbury was a Federalist community who said we didn't want this war, at least the elite said. And Welburn talks about that. And apparently, he talks about it for such a long period that they eventually get rid of him. They accuse him of incompetence. They accuse him, my favorite is, he couldn't stand Salisbury. He went home, and he charged the government for all the liquor he made himself. In other words, he sold liquor to his own soldiers and paid himself to feed them. Now, that begs questions about the quality of Wilkes County liquor versus the quality of Rowan County liquor, but that's another story. Eventually, by 1814, Wellborn has been both a recruiter, a sort of scout throughout the southeast. He has been a frustrated commander, and the folks in Salisbury have gotten rid of him. Even though he got them to get the ladies of town, and I assume the elite ladies, imagine Mrs. Steele, okay, to make the regimental flag. So if we were to ever locate, and I don't know if it exists, the 10th Regiment's flag, it was made by the women of Salisbury. So again, this idea of showing your patriotism, but being somewhat still, shall we say, outside the norm of support, is still very much alive. A contingent of the 10th Regiment marched all the way to Niagara, participated in some of the campaigns. I won't go into too much detail about that, because I don't think it has that much local content. And the base would expand and shrink as various people go and come. So sometimes you have the idea that there's 1,200 people there, and then there are references to there only being 300. And I suspect sometime around 1813, there may not have been anyone there, other than a few caretakers or something of that nature. But for our purpose, the real story today in my remaining time is to focus upon the muster and the campaign of 1814. Now, all of you know, I hope, that that is, of course, the Creek Campaign, the Creek War that is associated with Andrew Jackson, that we'll talk some more about Andrew Jackson with our next presentation, and we'll talk about his Salisbury roots as we close the day out. But in 1814, the muster of militia for Rowan and area counties around us was to be conducted to support him. And I have an estimate for how many there were. Again, we can't prove who fought who didn't. But it is very clear from the logistical records that they hurried to this barrack area, as many troops as possible, and they only had room for about half the soldiers. And yet, what I find is the number 1,200 keeps appearing. 1,200 shirts are sent, Bob's frock coat, if you'll witness this again, thank you, thank you for the runway. If you assume that they were delivering 1,200 frock coats, you have to assume at the least that they were planning the logistics for 1,200 soldiers in the field. Did they all march? Did they all go to Georgia and Alabama? We simply can't tell. But for our purposes from Rowan, we know very well who got called up. And we'll show you this afterwards if you would like to see, but these were later printed by the state of North Carolina. And what you see when you look at these, and we have them in Gretchen's room at the library, is that all the North Carolinians who were called up are listed. 
And if you look carefully on page 197, the 6th Regiment in the 1814 called up, you find Rowan, 1st Regiment, and what I discovered is they're listed by neighborhood. They aren't alphabetized, and when you first look, they look extremely random. But because I have been studying the neighborhoods of Rowan for so long, it just suddenly jumped out at me, like some kind of 3D image here, and I'm going to focus on starting on name number 40 with a man named Adam Edelman, who's next to Andrew Boston, who's next to John Schulenberger, who's next to William Rhodes, who's next to Abraham Siegler, who's next to Henry Earnhardt, who's next to, pay close attention, Nathan Morgan, who's next to Jonathan Miller, who's next to Jacob Shaver, okay, and South Rowan. Yeah. William Rose lived where Enochville is. They're all clustered. And right over here, with less clustering, is one of my ancestors, Philip Rumpel, who lived down in the southwestern corner of the county. And number 67, is Enoch Phillips, who I know from other sources lived right where Faith is. And when you then look over on the right side, I won't read the names, but every one of those people lived on Bringle Ferry Road or Stokes Ferry Road. So what we find that we learn locally is that a selection of men out of the total militia list obviously end up being mustered. How they're selected, how they're drafted, or how they volunteer, I'm not expert enough to know. But what seems to be the case is that at least from the point of view of Rowan County, you have, shall we say, representative patriotism. That each neighborhood would be part of this issue. Each neighborhood would be part of what was going on. And that what you have, at least from the record's point of view, is fairly widespread citizenship here. Now, it's a little tentative, very thin ice. All of you know I never walk on thin ice. But, but fundamentally, I, I'm beginning to find a pattern. Now, another way to look at it, which I have not done, would be to essentially look at ages and see if these are all sons or, or, or young men. Grady Hall here's ancestor Solomon Hall appears in another company, and he would have been the fifth age of the younger man who would have marched off. His eventual neighbor and friend and business partner, Jacob Kreider, who becomes one of the heroes of the War of 1812 for this county, he too is a captain in one of these militias. I'm sorry, he's a captain in one of the other companies. And so you're seeing people who will come back and who will become the mainstays, if you will, of our local heritage. Now to kind of prove the point, if you turn to page 199 and 200, it still says Rowan County, 2nd Regiment, 3rd Regiment, and I don't know any of these dudes. Yeah. You know why? They don't live here. They may live in Davidson. They may live in places in Davie I don't dare go to. But essentially, these are from other places. Now, to, to clinch it, my own neighborhood in Iredell appears in the Iredell Regiment. And it is the people's names I grew up with. But only a small selection. Not everybody in the neighborhood is there. And so it begs questions about from the ground up, if you will, what essentially is happening that is patriotic, that is obligatory, that is social, that's perhaps economic, because you won't be surprised to learn the rich people are the captains and the poor people are the privates. You know, the same people that you hear about in every war are our officers in that way. And so, but again, you see here a really, really deep way in which Rowan is tangled into this war. Now, Sarah Lemon, and I will finish up in the next 10 minutes so you can ask questions. Sarah Lemon details from the records she found exactly what happened to these, I'll say, 1,200 people who marched south. Well, the idea was that they would go march and support Andrew Jackson in the Creek campaign. And they do march. They have interesting events as they head south. Several of the riflemen from Lincoln County, that is, what is today Catawba, Lincoln, and Gaston, refused to cross the South Carolina line. 
because they are North Carolina militiamen. I don't know if they invoked that old saw called states' rights, but they had the right not to cross state lines. Uh, apparently, they were conjoled into going on down. Don't feel too proud because when you get to out when you get to Georgia, at least four men from Rowan County refused to cross the line into Alabama. The explanation is not done, so we don't know precisely what it means. But the men come down and they essentially get to Georgia, where they help to set up the base for the campaign. But they miss the great battle at Horseshoe Bend, where Jackson defeats the Creek. But the North Carolina troops, including Jacob Crowder's Rowan Company, which is mentioned, actually help in what is essentially the mop-up operations. So in late spring, et cetera, of 1814, Lemon tells us that, one, the Rowan troops and others built forts, bases along the frontier, that they participated in at least one expedition that rounded up Indians. They took 500 prisoners. And that they essentially were part of the security force that was basically put into play to essentially extend the American frontier west from Georgia, from the original line of forts, into the center of Alabama. It was at that point that Jesse Pearson, who at that time lived where Coulomby Plantation is today, he and his brother and his father had been leading politicians. And it is at that point that Jesse Pearson is, and I'm always going to say it wrong, Coulomby, not the plantation, but the actual creek tribe and village, he got the idea where he would name his plantation on the Yakin when he came back. So they're there into summer of 1814. Hostilities, in a sense, in, but more importantly, their enlistments go up. So remember again, Don pointed out, that support for this war was not unconditional. It was conditional. And numerous, of the, numerous components of the North Carolina force, once their enlistment were up, said, done, see ya, including many members of Jacob Crowder's company. Now, we don't know which ones, and not all of them. And I can't tell you which part of Rowan County they came from. But again, you are confronted with a Jesse Pearson, who was a Federalist, whose brother as a congressman was opposed to the war, was an outspoken opponent of it, commanding the expedition to help Andrew Jackson. And when it really was, you know, when your obligation was up, see ya, been fun. And essentially, they started to go home. Perhaps the oddest tidbit I learned in all this from Sarah Lemon is that when these enlistments were up, all the soldiers had an option. They could go home on their own, or they could wait and go officially. And apparently some of them did it on their own, some of them did not. The other thing that fascinated me is they were stripped of their equipment. In other words, this suggests that much of what they were using in weaponry and perhaps even that frock coat of Bob's was essentially issued to them through the requisition system. And that very likely much of what they carried with them was not part of this old myth that you know everybody's a minute man and they were launched off with their rifles and their powder horns, but rather that they were more likely using what we would call GI stuff, government issue stuff. All kinds of tidbits that were only, at least from the local level, beginning to figure out. Lemon does say that most of them march back to the barracks, and they are actually dismissed from service from that point. She also mentions that periodically through the war years, Salisbury celebrated many of the events. There is a celebration in 1813 with a parade. It was to celebrate, uh, I forgot his rank at the time, but Perry, Perry's victory on Lake Erie. And there was a parade here through town for it. And there was apparently a celebration as well when the troops came back in 1814. So Salisbury truly was the logistical place, if you will. Now, in my last few minutes, let me remind you why they fought this war. This in no ways contradicts or, or embellishes what Don said. I found that very, very well spoken and profound. But there's a very interesting impact that occurs that fits my model once this war is over. 
more poor people leave. If we were to study it, and we have it, my suspicion is we would be shocked as to how many of our people with our family names end up in Indiana and Illinois or Alabama by 1818. There is, there is some evidence that there was a small surge in 1816 of prices and production, but that once the national recession occurs by 1819, many Rowan citizens aren't here. And we haven't studied that. We don't know enough about it. So for example, we know that many Rowan people are moving to Union County, Illinois by then, and we know there's a whole community of us up there that come back and forth and we simply don't know enough. But that's linked to what the War of 1812 will call it accomplished. So we know that those folks out in the country I'm worrying about or wondered about, they, they made a decision because of this war. Second, the elite stayed. Who won the War of 1812 in Rowan County? The rich people on the river. Here's how. Some of you know in North Carolina history, if you were hearing about the war, you would immediately launch into the famous Archibald de Beau Murphy thesis, that Murphy and his friends after the War of 1812 attempted to reform the most backward state in the Union, which North Carolina was, politically, economically, you could argue socially, and that they attempted to bring what were called internal improvements to the state. Then there's always a test question on it. There's always the two things. You had to know the internal improvements, which meant navigation of the rivers, the building of canals, and then you had to know all about the public education stuff. I'm going to ignore public education for the moment. Salisbury was at the center of this effort towards internal improvements. And it is very clear, now that we're looking at it, that what locals wanted was to navigate the Yakin River. They wanted to make that river work better. Jesse Pearson, the person who commanded the troops into Alabama, actually was part of a family business that ran flatboats from Wilkesboro all the way down to the narrows of the Yakin, which is where Baden is today. They then produced a portage, walked around the narrows, and they then went back into at Sneedsboro, a town on the Yakin, and then the idea was to float down the P.D. River to the South Carolina ports. Murphy's plan, of course, was the improvement of the Yakin system. He formed a company. His partner was Jesse Pearson. Jesse Pearson actually sold his Coolamy plantation to finance his investment in the Yakin. And he and Murphy and several other local elites attempted to found the town of Clinton. By 1817 and 1818, they had taken out a charter of, for a new town they called Clinton, named after the Clinton who built the Erie Canal, or Erie Canal in New York. And I am sure their intent, more than we like to say in North Carolina history, was to bring a version of the Erie Canal to us. Clinton was located where the South Yakin and the Yakin come together. If you've ever been up to Hannah's Ferry Road and you've gone out there to where the swamp land is, I don't advise you do it after 5 p.m. I've tried that scientifically. At any rate, you, that is essentially across the South Yakin where that was. By 1823, the county of Rowan had built two public covered bridges, publicly financed bridges. And we tend to think, oh, Salisbury had bridges. Untrue. Well, those bridges were directed to take you not to Salisbury, but to Clinton. One of them's Beards Bridge. Will eventually become Beards Bridge, and the pillars are still out there in the river. If you look carefully at where they point, they point to what was to become a river port for Murphy's great dream of navigating the Yak. What were they going to do with that? Well, the proof is in Coolamy. The Harstons, one of Virginia's richest families, sent a branch down here. They bought Coolamy. They invested in it. And they've been there ever since. But the other place you forget about is the War of 1812 folk hero, Jacob Crider, who supposedly was the great leader in Alabama and Georgia 
who comes back here is in a sense the golden boy of Salisbury for several, several years. But by 1819, he has gone up to what we call Woodleaf and built the famous plantation house, Mount Vernon, where he had a grist mill, a sawmill, where his next door neighbor was Solomon Hall, where within a mile there were three other large plantations. My suspicion is that was the largest concentration of slaves in Rowan County in one square mile of anywhere else in our history. And there they were to grow cotton, but more particularly wheat, and market it by flatboat to the South Carolina ports. And Salisbury might have continued as the banking center, but it's very clear to me at the least they were assuming that Clinton would be the river port for a whole area that was old Rowan, Davy, Davidson, etc. Never happened. For a variety of reasons, the National Recession, the, in, the incalcitrance of the North Carolina legislature, that's no besmirchment of you at all, Tony. <laughs> uh, essentially, it never happened. And Murphy, as Mike Hill and I were talking about at lunch, may have gone mad over it. He certainly became depressed. And Pearson lost much of his fortune. And the Harstons had to do other things. They grew other things and went off in other directions. And John still died. So did Spruce McKay, who owned our mill, Pond, to the west of town. And Salisbury, in a sense, entered into, by the 1820s, a different direction. And frankly, never recovered in the sense of what was intended because of this very interesting war that Mr. Madison could be named for. I'll end to turn it over to questions, and I'll own up to any. I'm allowed to question? Are we doing that later? Yeah, we'll do questions. OK. Raise your hand if you've got a question. Go ahead and chat it out. Sure, you go ahead. With the, 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 my research with the local militias is that every county has has divided into voting districts and militia districts, which would be one of the same. Yes. So you're, you said that Rowan had like 20 militia districts, each of those would have had, say, anywhere from 50 to 200 men, depending on number of people between 15 and 55 that are required to be part of the local militia. Local militia being the voting district, but also being the volunteer fire department and all the other civic activities that were going on. They were required when this draft came up to, to provide soldiers for this North Carolina militia, which was separate from this county militia. Uh, it depended on how many volunteers they had for how they did it. Um, most counties ended up having to have a draft that gave me 60, but it wasn't that patriotic that they wanted to. The comedian had 15 people from this militia district, and they had five, so therefore they had to draw straws or whatever they did. Um, there were most reports in some counties, I don't know if you're thinking down east, they actually had to have a drawing because they had too many people that wanted to join the same militia company. So it, it would be the only way they had to do. Very rarely did they have the right number of people that were in the um, The other point I'm going to make is that North Carolina did not, was not that involved at all in the whole War of 1812. The only battle that took place, I said before, was on Okra. The 10th U.S. did go up into the Chesapeake, up into Canada. The several experiences that the state militia went up to Norfolk, down into Alabama. The report is that there was only 18 men killed in action during the war of 1812 in North Carolina. Um, I read it somewhere. That's because of the, they were not in battle very often. Um, they were in get this garrison duty so much of the time. And actually, the 10 U.S. troops that were up in Canada were actually referred to as being rather low quality troops that they just soon not use them to have to fight. Okay. Next question. I think so. Go right ahead. This business of uh, how the troops were raised, Gary. I'm uh, speculating, I will tell you. Yeah. You got regulars, you had U.S. volunteers the first year. Um, then you have what are just called volunteers. They appear to be raised at the state level. Tennessee used a lot of that. And, uh, Hence its nickname. Uh, and then you had the militia, and I think 
This is right. That sometimes they call off the militia and you just have to volunteer. Other times there were not enough volunteers and they have to draw stars. And I think sometimes actually we'd be affluent. Pony up some money to get enough volunteers so in order to have to be drafted. You have any sense for how it's clearly a militia unit. It's yeah. not. Uh, it's, it's, not volunteer. It, it, it's hard to tell, and my suspicion is, given where I recognize these people listed from neighborhoods, they do come in small numbers from each of the districts Bob talked about, but nothing in the records I could find would indicate if it's voluntary or draw, drawing of a lot. There's just nothing I can figure out. Uh, I wish I could, but no, I don't know. It is listed by the state printer that they are militia. And they are detached. They're detached militia. So that means their whole company isn't called up, but they're detached from their original regiment. That's the way I interpret it. Luther? The mic is coming. There's two terms with militia. The common militia and the volunteer militia. By law, every able body has you know, two legs, two arms, two eyes, and teeth. 15 to 45, every male was in the common militia. They had to meet at least once a year to prove that they could fire a rifle and musket. They had to have at least a rifle and musket and some power and ball. And this was in case something happened in the invasion, an Indian uprising, that the local, everybody would be called out to defend the homestead. So everybody was obligated to be, in a sense, a militia. But then you had the volunteer militia, which were, after 1812, the problem was no one liked to go and spend two or three days in Salisbury doing this training and doing all, you know, uh, old... That's a militia, don't worry about it. Yeah. Old Betsy the cow is going to have a mm -hmm. calf and she's had problems and I need to stay at home. Some of the young people very much liked the idea of parading and marching and being, in a sense, kind of like a civic club, and those were the volunteer militia. The problem is, in 1812, I don't know exactly how developed the volunteer militia was versus the common everybody. The, the answer is, I don't think the records tell us. I don't think we know. Anybody else? Over here. Wasn't the part of the I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Does anybody know the answer to that? Probably. Sure. I, I don't honestly know. I know he was from up there. Sure. Barbara? Maybe more than I had no idea. He was my ancestor. His father was in the Revolutionary War, and that's on his two sons. Mm -hmm. And his son, Nathan. They're all buried in the uh, Morgan Cemetery. Right, Island Spokes Ferry. Mm -hmm. And that's also the Morgan mustering grounds. Yes. I've seen no record there was a mustard there in this war. I can't tell you the way. I can't tell you which war, but I had no idea the name was actually in. Well, his name's on the list. I can't tell you beyond that. Lillian, you had a question. I think you get to be last. Yeah. Yeah, I've not looked at that at all. There are pension records and Mrs. McCubbins, for those who aren't from town, Mrs. McCubbins was our great collector of genealogical and public records. She does have a reference to a Ma Ma Micah I, Micah we'll call him, Cannon, uh, giving over his land to John Fulton after the war. And it was clearly, it was the land you're referring to. So the answer is probably yes, but we haven't studied that. Can I read? Yeah. At the end of your service, and my sense is most of them were sold through middlemen. They sold them to people who want to buy Yeah. And luckily, we don't know that answer yet. Can I, can I read a funny quote to finish? Yeah, Gary's going to close out, and then we'll switch out. 
I didn't have time, and Jason Harp, who was to have joined me today, would have done this portion of it, but one of the commanders was Joseph Graham, a Revolutionary War hero of Cornwallis' invasion. He lived in Lincoln County, and he was one of the pioneer iron manufacturers of that area. He sold, according to the records, 30,000 bullets to the Army during the war. So again, the elite are part of this. His family loves to tell the story about him to give us a character of that time. And this, I think, comes from this period, but I can't guarantee it. General Graham was fond of, fond of the Scotch-Irish dish of mush and milk for supper. It was never omitted from the family table. The mush was in a white china bowl and the milk in a small pitcher. Once when the governor and another friend stopped in and the children were grown, the children did not think it proper to serve the mush and the milk. When the son asked for permission to leave it off, the general's reply was, tell your sister she can make as many kinds of cake as she wishes and put as many times, kinds of preserves on the table as she wishes, but I'm as good as the governor or anyone else and I intend to have my mush and milk. When supper was served, the governor took a portion too.